Our topic today is competition law in China. Specifically, we'll be focusing on China's new anti-monopoly law, which came into force August 1st, 2008. In Chinese, Zhonghua Renmin Gonghe Guo Fan Long Dian Fa. My name is Virginia Harper Ho, and I'm a visiting assistant professor at Indiana University Bloomington School of Law. It's my pleasure to be with you today. As many of you may know, there are a number of uh, global antitrust regulators today. Most prominent among them is the United States um, Antitrust Review Authorities, as well as the European Union. In addition to that, uh, many of you may know that China has come to the fore as a third player, specifically with the enactment of the anti-monopoly law. China has gained greater attention uh, among uh, deal makers, among business executives, among academics as well, and there's good reason for that. We'll introduce you to why that is today. Uh, the anti-monopoly law is, is only the latest uh, in China's efforts to develop a full-fledged competition uh, regulatory system. And in recent years, foreign companies have come into the spotlight uh, for antitrust review, uh, merger control uh, review, and some fairly significant transactions. Many of you may be familiar with some of these. Uh, one of these in November 2004 involved Sony, and a Chinese battery company, De Xian, argued that Sony had abused its dominant market position by forcing com companies just to use Sony batteries with Sony cameras and video cams. One reason for that, Sony alleged, was because of the safety factor. Um, using non-Sony uh, equipment, uh, apparently, uh, led to increased risk of fires. However, interesting in this case was that Sony's, quote, dominant market position was only 20% of the PRC market. Nonetheless, uh, the Chinese battery company was uh, apparently losing business and brought suit. As of early 2008, this case was still pending in the first intermediate court in Shanghai without a resolution. It's possible an independent settlement has been reached, although I'm not familiar with the details of that. Um, just recently did a check on that, was unable to find whether or not a decision had been reached. But that's an example of Chinese competitors looking to use antitrust and competition law against uh, foreign companies who are fairly well known in the market. Another prominent example in July 2008 uh, was a proposed deal by Carlyle Group to acquire Shugong Group Construction Machinery Company. Uh, in that case, the original offer contemplated Carlyle having a majority stake in the company. Uh, because of regulatory concerns, uh, that deal was adjusted. Carlyle ended up with a minority interest. So you can see that even in major uh, in major cases like this, involving foreign uh, acquirers of domestic companies, Chinese regulators have begun to, begun to play a very active role, and investors would do well to, to pay attention to developments in China's regulatory environment. Uh, the next prominent cases come up fairly recently, and both of these um, have arisen in the wake of the enactment of the anti-monopoly law, again, which came into effect in August of this year. In September 2008, uh, a lawyer filed, sent a series of letters to the major antitrust regulators in China. We'll introduce those in a moment. Uh, but suffice it to say, there are three of them. Uh, allegations were made against Microsoft. And one of the concerns that was raised is that uh, the case was against Microsoft, or these filings against Microsoft, were solely based on the fact that Microsoft has a 70% market share in China. So commentators and academics looking at this case were concerned that uh, with the passage of the anti-monopoly law, there might be more aggressive action targeting foreign companies who just happen to be big. Uh, so the question is, is being big bad enough? Uh, no action has been taken uh, in response to those uh, letters, apparently. Um, in one case, um, in, one, in the case of one of the regulators, the Ministry of Commerce, they deferred to even respond to that action. Uh, another regulator that's responsible for price monitoring is currently reviewing that. Um, likely it won't go anywhere, but again, raises the concern that just because you're big in China and you're a prominent foreign company, will you become a target? Another example, and this one uh, is of a greater substantive interest, is September 2008. Uh, you may be familiar with the proposed acquisition by Coca-Cola of Huiyuan Drinks Company. Uh, that acquisition totaling a potential deal value of U.S. Uh, $2.3 billion. This is uh, being viewed as a major test case under the new legislation. Filings have been made for merger uh, review, 
and that review is currently in process. That initial review takes about 30 days and can be extended, so there's no uh, decision that's been reached regarding that transaction yet. But again, a transaction to watch and another example of how foreign companies uh, need to be aware of these developments in China. Uh, today, the, just a brief introduction to the, the flow of today's talk. Uh, it'll be simply an overview. This is obviously a very complex area of regulation and also one that's uh, developing even as we speak. Uh, so the, the following points will be covered today. First, I'd like to give a brief introduction to just the evolution of competition law in China, as, again, as some of the earlier examples show. Uh, this is not a, an entirely new thing. There's been regulation in this area previously, um, but this is a significant development. Uh, next, we'll give a brief introduction to the uh, anti-monopoly law itself, some of the uh, major, major uh, areas that are covered by the new law, and then proceed to talk about some of the open questions um, that have not been resolved by the, the legislation itself or the implementing regulations, but will need to be worked out in practice. Finally, we'll consider the potential impact of the anti-monopoly law uh, for those of you who may be involved in transactions both inside and outside of China. So first, just to take a look at how we got to where we are today. Um, again, this is not something entirely new. Uh, in 1993, China passed a law against, anti against unfair competition. The law against unfair competition is the primary legislation in this area prior to the anti-monopoly law passage. It prohibits price fixing, it prohibits tie-in sales, it has provisions against bribery, it has provisions against deceptive advertising, as well as appropriation of business secrets. So there's a number of areas it covers that overlap to some extent with the anti-monopoly law and provided a foundation for the drafters uh, considering um, development of that regulation. In 1997, that was followed by enactment of the pricing law. As its name suggests, it prohibits price fixing. It also prohibits um, price discrimination. Uh, in, early, in the early years of this decade, 2003, 2005, 2006, uh, China began to focus more on regulating uh, the growing area of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, prior to that time, there had not been specific regulations focused on M&A. Um, but the early years of uh, this century uh, and this decade have brought about a number of key regulations. Among them were the 2003 provisional regulations on foreign investors merging with or acquiring domestic companies. Again, uh, that regulation focusing only on foreign acquisitions. And that is those provisional regulations create an initial framework for merger review uh, by the competition authorities of China and specifically by the Ministry of Commerce, or MOFCOM. Those were followed in 2006 by final rules, uh, again, which make some modification, um, but are, cur are currently, or rather I should say prior to the anti monopoly law, were the primary rules governing merger review in China. And again, those were the 2006 rules on acquisitions of domestic enterprises by foreign investors. And those were enacted after a rising tide of, of M&A activity in China, which is still ongoing, though they may, uh, many expect to be substantially affected by the current economic crisis. Nonetheless, um, those, provided, those regulations provided some initial guidance for foreign investors considering um, deals in China. Uh, finally, there are a number of other regulations that also regulated anti-competitive, uh, rather competitive behavior uh, prior to the enactment of the anti-monopoly law, and one of those, for, for example, is the banking law, and it prohibits, uh, quote, improper competition among banks. So again, industry-specific, sector-specific regulations are out there as well. But these are the major uh, regulations that form the legal framework prior to the enactment of the AML. So now, uh, how, how did the AML come to be? How long a period have we been talking about the drafting process? Uh, Regulations in China can come into being quite quickly. They can also take a long time. This is one that took a long time, and that gives some indication not only of the complexity of the issues, but of the, just the, the complexity involved in China's evolving economic development and a number of critical issues about the future of state-owned enterprises, about the role of the private sector that were not fully uh, uh, developed and fully debated and had not reached a clear resolution in the early years when the prospect of the anti-monopoly law first came to be discussed. It's taken about 13 years since 1994 
uh, until again August, two, uh, August 30th of 2007 when the AML was enacted uh, to bring that process to completion. The AML drew, has drawn extensively on foreign competition law, particularly the EU and German law. It includes also some elements of U.S. practice, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, the context of the AML is, is quite interesting, and again, this is one of the reasons why it took so long to, to come into being. Uh, as many of you may, may know, China is a, an intensely competitive environment for business, and so many of the drafters and many in the business community have been concerned not about uh, lack of competition, but rather about excessive competition. Uh, in recent months, we've heard about the milk scandals, about uh, problems with food quality control, other issues that have been driven largely by uh, ultra uh, excessive focus on profits and uh, concerns about excessive competition ha have been in many ways more visible than concerns about lack of competition. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a rising tide of uh, merger and acquisition uh, deals involving Chinese targets, many of them quite significant in the Chinese economy, and uh, many of those acquisitions by foreign investors. So uh, just as we've seen some very high profile acquisitions here in the United States draw a lot of public attention, the same has been true in China. Another issue is the question of how this new law might impact state-owned enterprises. Uh, particularly those that are dominant in the Chinese economy and have a, a, a protected status. That's not all uh, state-owned enterprises, but certain uh, sectors of the economy in which state-owned enterprises are, continue to dominate. Questions of whether this law may have an impact from a policy standpoint on those enterprises. And, and those are just tricky questions that, that raised issues during the drafting process. Again, we'll touch on some of those in a moment. Other issues include the question of how to deal with administrative monopolies. Again, these are, are areas that we'll touch on uh, more detail in a few minutes, but uh, present some knotty political issues. And then again, the question of how this law might apply to small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs. So uh, a lot of complex issues gave rise to uh, substantial debate during the drafting process. And it's interesting to note that foreign uh, experts were involved in the drafting process and, and provided comment throughout that uh, was reflected in many respects in the final drafts of the, of the legislation. For example, the American Bar Association provided substantial comments on earlier drafts, and, and they're just one of, of the foreign uh, groups that was consulted during the process. So uh, a lot has gone into this law, and there's a lot to talk about, a lot to focus on going forward. Uh, the the Monopoly law, again, took effect in August of this year, August 1st, 2008, and implementing guidelines uh, early implementing guidelines have been issued um, just a few days later, and uh, a number of additional regulations can be expected during the coming year. So first, uh, the goals of the anti-monopoly law are several, as you might expect. Uh, first among those is consumer protection. Uh, secondly, the law is intended to protect, quote, societal and public interests. Question whether that means small industries and national champions to get special treatment in the implementation of this law, but nonetheless uh, focus on preserving public interests. Also, promotion of the socialist market economy uh, as a stated objective of the AML. So you can see that elements of uh, China's historical socialist uh, legacy also playing a role here um, as far as the objectives of the AML, and we'll see it in some of the details of the provisions as well. Uh, finally, uh, another goal of the AML is to prohibit monopolistic conduct and protect competition. Um, obviously, this is a competition law, and that goal remains central. Question whether, again, this implies an intention to crack down on administrative monopolies, which are uh, more embedded in China's political uh, and economic structure. So um, again, we'll touch on that in a moment. As far as the structure of the AML itself and the institutional framework that it operates in, one primary piece of this puzzle is not yet in place, and that is the Anti-Monopoly Commission, which the law contemplates will be formed. Uh, observers expect it will continue. It will be formed from representatives of the various uh, ministries that are currently involved in regulating competitive conduct in China at the moment, and uh, it remains to be seen which of these agencies will take a dominant role in the new Anti-Monopoly Commission. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, 
Currently, however, there are three primary agencies that are involved. The first is the Ministry of Commerce, or MOFCOM. Uh, MOFCOM is responsible for merger review, again, under the 2006 regulations that I discussed earlier. Uh, secondly is the State Administration for Industry and Commerce, or the SAIC. Uh, their current responsibility includes review of monopoly agreements and examination of allegations of abuse of dominant market position. Uh, they were one of the agencies involved in the, in the allegations filed against Microsoft that I uh, mentioned earlier. The third uh, primary agency is the National Development and Research Commission, or the NDRC, and that is the agency currently charged with enforcing the pricing law. Uh, separate national security review that is required under the 2006 regulations uh, is an interagency group. Uh, it will be it is contemplated to be included under the AML as well. Uh, the, con the precise makeup of that organization is not yet clear. Uh, as with the Anti-Monopoly Commission, it likely uh, will be headed up by one, of, one or more of the three regulators currently involved in the area. But that will be established under separate state council regulations. Again, most people expect it to be headed up by the NDRC and by MOFCOM. Uh, because those are the agencies currently involved with National Security Review under the current uh, regulations that were superseded by the AML. So we'll see how that plays out. As far as the scope and coverage of the AML, um, again, it's, it's not an entirely new piece of cloth compared to uh, regulations in the U.S. and the EU and prior competition law in China. So let's just walk through briefly uh, this, the major areas that are covered by the law. First is a system of pre-merger notification and review. Uh, that new merger review process supersedes the existing process that was set into place under the 2006 regulations, and this new process will apply equally to foreign and domestic uh, deals. Secondly, the AML prohibits monopoly agreements. This includes price fixing cartels, agreements to divide markets, certain vertical agreements. And as under EU regulation, there are some exemptions to this prohibition. These include uh, agreements that uh, may result in increased environmental protection, that may foster greater competitive, competitiveness rather for small and medium-sized enterprises, or for agreements that promise to promote international trade and foreign economic cooperation. So there's a number of uh, areas that may not fall within the, the prohibitions, and for a given agreement, uh, it stands, uh, it's a good, good practice to review those exemptions and see whether they apply. Um, they are quite broad. Uh, thirdly, prohibition, uh, the AML prohibits abuse of dominant position, and this is an interesting area uh, because of the definition of dominance. Dominance is defined as the ability to control market entry, prices, quantity, and deal terms. And in contrast to some of the earlier drafts, the AML adopts a rebuttable presumption of dominance if market share is over 50%. Uh, so again, that is a rebuttable presumption. And uh, factors that can be looked at in either determining whether, uh, regardless of a dominant position, a certain action, pricing action in particular, is justified will probably involve a case-by-case -case weighing of various factors to, to determine whether the agreement, uh, whether, I'm sorry, um, the action taken actually fosters competition or may result in reduced competition. Uh, the import of this is that if you are a market player with a dominant position, you are prohibited from abusing that market position by setting unfairly high prices or selling at unfairly low prices. Um, setting unfairly high prices isn't a violation under U.S. law, but it is under Article 81 of the EU treaty. So again, this is an area which, which is drawn more substantially from continental law than from U.S. models. But again, abuse of dominant market position is an area that we've already seen being raised in uh, some of the early um, cases or allegations made against foreign companies. So question again whether dominance will be interpreted to be sufficient in and, in and of itself. Chances are it will not. But nonetheless, here's the defini definition of dominance for you and the implications of that. The next area that's covered by the AML is a section devoted to state-owned enterprises and addressing competitive and anti-competitive behavior in that sector. Next, administrative monopolies. Again, we'll talk about that more in a moment. 
And lastly, the AML includes provisions that prohibit trade associations from organizing members for anti-competitive purposes, but does encourage them to guide members to promote market competition. So a recognition there of the key role that trade associations can play in promoting market competition, but wanting to keep them from engaging in practices that may discourage competition. Uh, not long ago, there was a case involving one of the major noodle, uh, instant noodle trade associations in China, and, and that, really, that case really brought some of these issues to the fore. Allegations that the trade association uh, was engaging in prohibited conduct to try to uh, set prices within its industry. So um, that's an area that's gotten renewed attention under the AML. Let's talk now about the merger control system set up under the AML. Again, this does draw, um, in, in many respects, on existing merger review processes. But it's important, and it's important for a number of reasons. One of the most interesting is that it applies not only to domestic transactions, but also to wholly offshore deals if they may restrict or affect competition in the PRC. So this is one primary reason um, why the AML should matter to you and why China is becoming more, much more important as a regulator in this area, and, and perhaps one of what we may call the big three, the US, the EU, and now um, China as well. Um, notification triggers. So I'll just walk through these. They're here on your slide. First, global trade volume um, or turnover of all related companies so that can be the parties to the deal. That could also be affiliates. Um, that in the previous year exceeded uh, RMB uh, 10 billion, which is equivalent to USD uh, 1.46 billion, and a PRC trade volume of the two sides of the deal or two parties uh, in the previous fiscal year of RMB 400 million. So that's the first threshold. The second is PR PRC trade volume, not global trade volume, but PRC trade volume, again, of related companies in the previous year in excess of RMB 2 billion which is equivalent to approximately USD 292 million. And again, a pre PRC trade volume uh, in the previous year of RMB 400 million. So again, the first threshold would be uh, global trade volume in excess of 10 billion uh, with the same uh, transaction uh, threshold for the prior year within the PRC of RMB 400 million. The second threshold, uh, PRC only trade volume of all related companies, again, at that um, RMB 2 billion level. The alternative, however, point three there is, is pretty important. Uh, even if you don't meet those technical thresholds, there is a subjective threshold where evidence may indicate that the concentration has the potential to foreclose or restrict competition. Um, and there are a number of factors that the regulators will look at in determining whether this is the case. This includes market share, market power, market concentration, structure of the deal, its a potential effect on consumers, and also on relative, relevant business operators, end quotes. And that can include not only customers, but also suppliers and competitors. Another factor that will be considered is the effect of the deal on national security. Uh, again, we'll give some further attention to that in a moment. So as you can see, two primary objective standards and one that includes a number of subjective factors. Um, next, as far as the process of re merger review, review process involves a notification being filed with MOFCOM or uh, once the new uh, Anti-Monopoly Commission is set up with that body. There's an initial 30-day review and the agency can also take a, an extended period of time beyond that 30 days up, um, up to 180 days to provide uh, a response. There is a separate national security view. Again, that's uh, previously was included in the 2006 regulations, and that will be conducted by a new body. Um, so, you know, we have yet to see how, exactly how that'll flesh out, but likely it will be conducted in a manner similar uh, to uh, that under current regulations. An interesting feature of the national security review process is the definition of what constitutes national security. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the U.S. process under CFIUS which was recently re revised in, in light of the Dubai Ports deal. Um, and uh, most of, of the national security language here is taken from um, the existing 2006 merger guidelines. However, under those uh, guidelines, 
Transactions that will trigger review are those that affect, quote, key industrial sectors as well as the national economy or those that involve well-known trademarks or national brands. So as you can see from, from that list, what we're talking about is not strictly national security related, but uh, can include a lot of deals that really uh, have to do more with key sectors of the, of the economy and uh, questions of whether this, quote, national security review is really directed at allowing China to have a way to maintain government control of key industries. So uh, we'll see how that plays out in the implementation phase. Uh, nonetheless, that, that's a, a rather unique feature of the uh, national security review process in China. Now, what could the outcome be? Uh, supposing the regulators view the proposed deal to be anti-competitive, uh, there's a couple options. Uh, one could be uh, that they could require divestiture of a portion of the uh, assets or a portion of the company that is, or divisions that are involved in the deal. And uh, that could be a condition to avoid a concentration that would be deemed to be excessive. Um, the uh, other possibility is that the parties could rebut that finding and present alternative evidence that, in fact, the deal would uh, foster competition rather than decrease competition. There's opportunity to do that. Um, or if they can demonstrate that the concentration is in the public interest. So there is opportunity for review and to respond to the initial findings of the regulators. Um, but as is typical elsewhere, one, one possibility is that the deal would have to be restructured in order for it to go through and receive approval. So um, again, that's not a, a radical departure from what's been done before, but it is incorporated into the AML. Now, as far as enforcement, the AML does devote significant attention to that. And I'll just run through these real briefly here. They're on uh, your slide, and, and hopefully these will not be an area of focus for you, but more for your counsel, uh, looking at what might be the potential outcome if you are uh, facing an enforcement action. Uh, but nonetheless, here it is uh, for your review. Uh, first is if there's an illegal concentration, for example, in an M&A deal, and again, the major response from the regulars will be in order to either unwind the transaction if it's already occurred, and then there's potential of additional fines up to RMB 500,000. So hopefully you will not run into that. Hopefully you will have gone through the review process. Uh, hopefully you will have made those, those notification filings and received a response and had opportunity to work with the regulators to structure the deal in a way that it will receive clearance. Um, Going on then to illegal monopoly agreements or abusive dominant position, again, uh, that may be the, the new focus of, of certain competitors in your industry. Um, if it is indeed found that you have abused a dominant position, uh, the consequences are to require disgorgement of illegal gains and there is a fine of additional 1 to 10 percent of the prior year turnover before the agreement would, would have taken effect. So that can obviously be quite significant. Those fines could be up to RMB. Uh, 500,000 as well. Next, anti-competitive acts of trade associations, um, also subject to similar fines. There is also a right of, for private litigation for civil damages. Um, and get, again, this can be levied by competitors, could be levied by suppliers, could be levied by customers. And guidelines by the Supreme People's Court uh, governing these cases were recently issued in July providing some guidance on, on some of the details of how those suits can be brought and what are some of the parameters uh, that need to be considered. Um, but again, important to note that private litigation for civil damages is uh, one of the enforcement tools under the AML. Next, uh, there is a right to administrative and court review if uh, as a regulated entity or as a party subject to an order or to a an early enforcement decision object to that uh, decision. Uh, there's internal administrative review and then additional court review uh, as well under the administrative litigation law and existing uh, administrative reconsideration regulations. Finally, penalty reductions and exemptions for self-reporting are included. However, the standards for those are not yet clear. So again, that'll be an area to look at implementing regulations and see if further guidance is provided. Um, that there obviously is an intention that there will be an incentive to, to work with regulators and also to voluntarily disclose uh, transactions or agreements that, that might raise questions, but nonetheless um, unclear as to how those will be dealt with and what kind of reductions, if any, uh, will be forthcoming as 
as these cases unfold. And lastly, uh, administrative agency anti-competitive behavior. Again, this leads into questions concerning state-owned enterprises and administrative monopolies. Those should be, are, should be subject to discipline by the superior authority. So interesting there that oversight of uh, companies that have clear ties to the state um, or to administrative agencies, uh, that conduct will be decided internally within the agency administrative structure as opposed to being subject to uh, either litigation or external uh, regulation by the, the Anti-Monopoly Commission or the current regulatory authorities responsible for competition law in China. So another unique feature uh, more related to China's current uh, political and economic structure. So we've touched on a number of these already, but just to, just to summarize, there are a lot of open questions under the AML. Uh, one of the, the most obvious of those is the question of institutional jurisdictional lines. As I mentioned, the new uh, regulatory body that's, that should be comprised of representatives of the current regulatory authorities has not yet been established. Question how those lines will be drawn, which agency will have the most clout, will have the most prominence, and uh, the most authority within that structure and what remaining roles will be left for those uh, current agencies, MOFCOM, the NDRC, and SAIC, um, beyond the Anti-Monopoly Commission. Next, a uh, question of how broad will the exemptions for monopoly agreements be interpreted? Exemptions, justifications, will those be interpreted similarly by the three agencies that have been handling those areas in the past? Um, and you know, will that change once the new Anti-Monopoly Commission is established? Uh, will there be new interpretations uh, now that the new regulations have come into being? Or will there be a reliance on past practice? Thirdly, impact on IP rights holders. Uh, there's some interesting uh, questions that I, I haven't had taken time to get into today. But one question is whether foreign IP license, licensing agreements may be targeted under these regulations. The reason for that is that the AML prohibits limits on purchases of new technology under those agreements. So those kind of clauses uh, will not be permitted. Um, since IP license, uh, licensors are typically foreign companies who are licensing domestic uh, license holders, question of whether these uh, prohibitions on monopoly agreements will be used to challenge those uh, restrictions and challenge those agreements uh, more broadly. Also unclear what will be the obligations of dominant IP rights holders. So uh, those, the general questions we talked about earlier about the scope of, of dominant position restrictions on uh, big market players, um, if you will, uh, how those apply in the IP context, uh, those have yet to be determined. And finally, the AML doesn't distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate uses of intellectual property. The, the primary clause in the AML that deals with this simply uh, prohibits abuse of uh, intellectual property rights and uh, intellectual property um, licenses, but does not prohibit uh, legitimate use of intellectual property. Um, and so query how the anti-competitive aspects of the AML will intersect with existing intellectual property regulations and uh, whether foreign companies may come under more scrutiny as a result. Uh, next stance on administrative monopolies. This was, again, an area of much debate during the drafting process of the AML. Uh, why? Because administrative monopolies are cases where the state is not only the regulator, but also the market participant. Uh, and there are a couple of examples of this. Uh, one example is uh, in a number of key industries, for example, airlines, banking, hospitals, and uh, railways. Those are industries that have not uh, been liberalized to the same extent as many other sectors. And the state uh, maintains a considerable uh, stake and in some cases exclusive stake in, in, in enterprises in those sectors. Also, administrative monopolies include uh, the practice of local authorities and indus industry regulators privileging local or affiliated firms through various forms of regulation and barring access to local markets from firms or enterprises outside those markets. So that's another example of administrative monopoly, which is quite common. Um, as of 2006, about 80% of state-owned enterprises were concentrated in eight sectors. And so this gives you some sense of the importance of administrative monopolies and also the questions regarding competitive practices within the state sector. 
Uh, these eight sectors included natural gas, electricity, telecom, and air transportation, again. Uh, there have been some breakups of of those industries, for example, allowing space for private aviation, um, some in the telecom sector as well. But these have been very limited. So again, question whether the anim animal apathy law will be used to further greater reforms in this area or greater protections, and whether some of the ex exemptions contained in the AML will, will be used to uh, protect these industries and these uh, monopolies, or whether it will, just, it will increase uh, space to challenge them and really further evolve uh, the role of the state and, and in, at the local level and in the economy as a whole. So some interesting questions there. Uh, next, a question of in institutional competency. Um, as we know, the area of antitrust regulation is, can be extremely technical in nature. And with the fairly recent uh, rise of, of the legal profession, of the judiciary, and the development of these is issues with uh, regard to competencies inside the agencies that are currently responsible for uh, administration of these regulations, there's been some concern that uh, particularly uh, the courts are not yet at the level where they will be able to handle the technical issues, uh, the economic analysis, uh, assessments of, of what constitutes uh, market share, dominant market position, those types of analyses uh, may not be within the technical competency uh, that currently resides within the courts and administrative agencies. Uh, my own view on that is that we will see the technical competency of those institutions continue to rise. Again, there's been extensive efforts made to benefit from the experience of external advisors, foreign experts in these areas, but nonetheless, those are things that take time to develop. And so, uh, for the time being, uh, most likely what will happen is that the Anti-Monopoly Commission will, will, will draw on the expertise of, of those with that level of competency uh, in the review stage, but uh, there will be some questions when, when we have cases coming before judges that are asked to, to make some of these decisions that may be beyond their technical competency. So we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, next, interagency coordination and consistency is an issue. We touched on that earlier when I spoke about uh, the question of institutional jurisdictional lines. Again, unclear which agency will emerge as, as the leader in the new Anti-Monopoly Commission or if power will be shared equally among the three regulators that currently have oversight in this area. Um, but as we saw earlier, there are a number of areas where the regulations are quite subjective, um, particularly that kind of catch-all uh, obligation to make a filing for, for merger review, even if you don't meet the first two objective thresholds. Uh, some of the standards there are fairly, fairly soft and open to interpretation. And so it remains an open question whether those three agencies will coordinate in, in providing consistent uh, responses to questions in those areas. Finally, uh, potential for coordination with foreign regulators this is already happening and is likely to happen, but we have not yet had a substantial number of cases arise um, where we've, we've been able to see how cooperation between Chinese regulators and U.S. or EU regulators in particular will play out. Obviously, um, the U.S. and EU regulators have an have a extensive experience um, coordinating investigations and coordinating assessments of anti-competitive conduct, particularly with regard to merger review. And we can expect that that will happen as China emerges, emerges as a dominant regulatory power. But exactly how that coordination will happen from a technical standpoint, from a timing standpoint, all those issues remain open. And again, we may see some indication of, of how those standards will be applied, how the AML uh, will be uh, worked out in practice how these issues will be viewed by regulatory authorities uh, with some of these new transactions. The Huiyan deal may be a good test case for some of these. So now let's, let's turn to uh, just a little brief discussion of the potential impact of the AML. And, and I, I put here in China and beyond because, again, very important to remember that merger review in particular can extend to even offshore deals can also extend to small deals as long as the perceived impact in China is great. Uh, so this is an area of interest even for transactions that have um, apparently uh, less to do with China, nonetheless uh, an area of, of interest and concern. However, uh, in general, the foreign investor community has welcomed the AML, has again been very active in providing uh, comment and debating the issues during the drafting process of the AML. 
The reason for that is because prior regulations focused more on foreign investors and did not uh, create a uniform playing field, a level playing field between foreign and domestic companies. So the hope is that with the enactment of the AML, there's now a level playing field among all parties, same rules apply to all, and also the AML has been viewed to be generally in line with international norms. Again, drawing he heavily on foreign examples, both from the EU and from the US, um, and then the expectation that just by uh, through the process of the drafting process and also by enacting these provisions and clarifying uh, the procedures for review, clarifying which institutions will be involved in regulating competitive beha behavior, uh, I'm sorry, rather fostering competitive behavior and regulating anti-competitive conduct, there will be greater transparency for market players. There is, however, concern that foreign companies and particularly foreign IP rights holders will be targeted. Um, much of, of that question or how that question plays out is not necessarily uh, limited to an institutional question or a question of how uh, state regulators will, will view these issues, but a question of, of how the law will be uh, taken up by consumers, by competitors, by suppliers uh, who may be dissatisfied uh, with the uh, conduct that they're, that they're uh, getting from their competitors and from dominant foreign companies in the Chinese market. So, um, question of, of whether the popular response to the law will be such that foreign companies will face a more aggressive enforcement environment. So we'll need to keep an eye out. We'll need to watch for some deals that involve both dominant PRC targets, for example, the Coke Huyvian deal, uh, as well as cases involving dominant foreign companies, of which Microsoft is an example. So uh, however those cases play out will give us some indication down the road of uh, the future of the AML. Nonetheless, it represents a significant improvement in the regulatory environment for uh, mergers and acquisitions in China and for all, all of those engaged in business there. Uh, so again, a positive development, an important piece of China's regulation that has finally come into being after a very long time and uh, has been welcomed by many um, as the important development that it is. In conclusion, I'd uh, just like to reiterate that PRC antitrust law is now a force to be reckoned with. Uh, those of you who are involved in multinational transactions, cross-border M&A deals, uh, will be well aware of the importance of hiring a regulatory counsel that can provide a coordinated antitrust review. Uh, as far as compliance is concerned, with regard to cross-border deals, obviously due diligence will need to take into account uh, the measures that are important under the AML as well as important in other jurisdictions. Uh, careful review of contracts for uh, existing agreements that may have predated the AML but may include uh, clauses that will be deemed to be in violation of the AML going forward. Those may call for amendment as your deal goes forward or post-closing. Uh, also careful review of existing IP agreements um, that the, the target may have entered into. Uh, be, again, for the simple reason that there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty as to how those agreements may be viewed. But again, careful uh, understanding of the terms of those agreements in light of the AML is important. And then certainly um, an, an assessment of the, the market numbers, uh, market share, sales, uh, all of those figures that play into those objective criteria for uh, triggering notification under the uh, merger control regulations of the AML. And uh, again, with bearing in mind that there's those subjective triggers as well. So careful understanding of how both parties and their affiliates uh, operate in China and the extent to which they may be deemed to have uh, crossed that, that threshold of, of, of size and as well as deal volume that might uh, bring them within that scope. And uh, again, just to reiterate, the importance of a globally coordinated antitrust review. So when you're in doubt, make a filing. Uh, there is a good chance that your deal is covered by the AML and obviously that will have an impact on deal timing. Again, at this stage, it's too soon to tell whether uh, the level of coordination among regulators, uh, regulators in China will be such that deal timing will be expedited, or whether instead we'll see a, a more extensive period of review just because the AML is so new. Uh, that probably is more likely in the near term, um, but again, it's just an issue to watch as you try to coordinate uh, antitrust review across jurisdictions, bearing in mind uh, that this is an an area, not a first impression, but certainly an area where regulators as well as um, 
companies that are that are applying and, and notifying the the, infor, the authorities for review will need to be flexible and just kind of understand uh, the need to, to give space for this to work out. Um, if you have any further questions, there are a number of resources available online to you. The uh, websites of MOFCOM and of the NDRC and SAIC will continue to have updates on this area for your reference. Uh, most of those sites are available both in English and in Chinese. So uh, let's keep an eye on this area. It's an interesting development and one that uh, promises to bring China even closer toward international uh, standards and uh, make China an even more important part of the global economy. Thank you.